So, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, <laughs> so, today we're going to learn about how to meditate according to the Buddha's method. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, I always like to emphasize uh, that the idea that, you know, the Buddhist teaching, of course, originates with the Buddha. And so, the word of the Buddha has a special place in all of Buddhism. And uh, this is something that is often, I think, not quite understood in Buddhist circles. Uh, we think that the teachings of any monk or any nun or any one in history is kind of equivalent. And very often we have a lot of faith and a lot of um, uh, respect for individual teachers. Uh, well, actually forgetting that the Buddha is the source of the entire tradition. Uh, and that any teaching that is given in the Buddhist world, uh, it has value only to the extent that it fits with the word of the Buddha. So the word of the Buddha is the foundation of everything else. Uh, and so it's actually very useful to go back to those early suttas and try to understand in more detail what the Buddha was talking about, how he presented meditation practice and all of these kind of things. And if you start to know a little bit about the suttas, you recognize very quickly that they are very rich teachings. There's an enormous amount of information there. There's an enormous amount of inspiring passages. Yeah, the idea of the Dhamma is, on the one hand, you want to have the information to know what you have to do, but you also want to be inspired by these teachings. Uh, the kind of twofold thing about reading and understanding the suttas. Inspiration on the one hand, uh, and then understanding on the other. Uh, and there's so much in there, and it's so uh, kind of, uh, very often very beautifully, very phrased and very clear, precise language. Uh, Sometimes people think that if you read modern authors, yeah, it is much easier to understand it because modern authors are often very fancy, they may be very articulate, uh, they may use very flowery language, and it can be very attractive sometimes, this kind of flowery language. But if you try to understand what they're saying, if you really try, uh, actually, it's not very easy to understand very often. Uh, have you noticed that in, sometimes in your life? Yeah, kind of... Uh, Language may be beautiful and attractive, but actually really knowing what's going on can be very hard. Whereas the Buddha's language is sometimes inspiring, but at the very least it's very precise. And so I would say that if you're going to understand the Dhamma well, if you're going to understand really what is going on, you're better off going to the suttas than going to any modern teacher. So don't listen to me. <laughs> you can just go now and go back and read the suttas. No, no, please don't do that because it's also useful to have a little bit of explanation of the suttas, and yeah, and uh, then gradually you build up your own confidence uh, in these teachings as we do that. Uh, so this is um, the reason why I like to use the suttas because it takes us back to uh, this. Uh, origin, where everything points back to. Everything in modern Buddhism only has meaning in relation to the word of the Buddha. Take away the word of the Buddha, everything falls apart, nothing is left. Uh, and that is just such an uh, important part of this. Uh. So we're going to do that, but one of the problems with this uh, is that very often the Buddha can seem so far away. Yeah, Two and a half thousand years ago in India, very different culture. Uh, yeah, and, and a very different time, and they had no iPhones, they had no cameras and recording equipment and these kind of things. They were still, actually they had recording equipment, but it was a very different kind of recording equipment. It was kind of straight into the, this recorder over here. And surprisingly how accurate this recorder here can be, yeah, when you look at the history of, of Buddhism. So uh, we, we know pretty much today that we have the word of the Buddha. We can know that for all kinds of historical reasons. Uh, so that recording they had in those days was actually also very remarkably precise. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, when we are dealing with someone like the Buddha, it can seem distant. Uh, you read the suttas and you wonder, are these just tales? Uh, is this reality? Did, uh, you know, are these stories that kind of were told? And why, or is this actually real? You know, it's kind of hard to hard to kind of distinguish between stories and reality sometimes. How real are they? Uh, and one of the great ways of making things more real is to travel to India. How many of you have been to India? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, well, quite a few of you have been to India. Okay, I've been to India many times. Have you been to India, Venerables? Yeah, have you been to India? Have you been to India? No, not, not yet. Okay, come soon. Come with me next time. I'm going again soon. So you can come with me. I'll, I'll take you to India. Uh, you've been to India, Venerables? Yeah, okay. Then, you went with me? But I lived in India. 
Ah, you lived in India. Yeah. Okay, so you are. Okay. Were you Indian in past life? Yeah. <laughs> you looked like you were Indian in past life. I reckon. Yeah. So. Uh, I think also I quite likely was Indian in the past life. But anyway, that's a different story here. <laughs> <laughs> and what is nice about going to India is that you enter the world of the suttas. Yeah? And this is almost literally, yeah? because when you go to the various places, uh, you read the sutta and you recognize the formation, you recognize the land, you recognize the hills. Yeah? You go to the Gijakuta, Gijakuta, the vulture's peak, yeah? and you kind of see the vulture, right? Well, this must be the Gijakuta. Yeah, or you go to the famous mountains around Rajagaha. One of my favorite things about uh, going to India, there's some nice stories in the suttas about the monks going to bathe in the hot springs. There's one of those hot springs at the root of one of the hills in Rajagaha. Yeah, so you read about this, okay, monks bathing in the hot springs, you think, whatever. It sounds like some kind of ancient story. The Buddha, the uh, king went to bathe there. And as soon as you start talking about ancient kings, you enter this realm of mythology. Well, that's what it feels like anyway, right? Ancient kings bathing in hot springs. Okay, not sure if this is real or not. Uh, but then you go to India. Uh, you go to the foot of that hill. And lo and behold, the Indians are still bathing in those same hot springs. The hot springs are right there, yeah? Two and a half thousand years later on. Uh, and it's like, it's like you enter the suttas. It's like you walk into those stories. Uh, and you realize these are not fairy tales. Uh, these are not kind of things that I mean, these are actually real historical <coughs> events. And this is the sort of thing that brings you closer to the Buddha. You start to get a feel for what is going on there. So uh, we, one of the things that we need to do as Buddhists is try to get a feeling for the Buddha as a person. Who was he? Yeah? And when we do get a feeling for the Buddha as a person, when you get like a personal relationship with the Buddha, then reading the suttas is actually a very, very different thing here. Yeah? It's like it comes alive. Uh, there's a feeling that the Buddha is talking to you, uh, to me, uh, to each one of us. Uh, and when the Buddha is talking to you, uh, it's actually far more powerful. It's not, no longer a story. It's no longer just talking to the audience in front of him. Uh, he's talking to all audiences in the future after him as well. Uh. So these are some of the things that we have to do when we want to understand the suttas, try to understand better who the Buddha actually was, uh, and try to kind of approach the Buddha and get a feeling for him as a person. Uh, this is very, uh, to my mind, a very fruitful thing to do. Uh, and uh, then we make the suttas come alive. So I will talk a little bit today about how to do the Buddha Nusati. Buddha Nusati is uh, the recollection of the Buddha, uh, and how we can do that in a way that actually make these things come alive uh, in, a, in a more powerful way. Uh, but um, for now, I want to talk a little bit about meditation practice just to get us started. Um, I haven't made a schedule for today, so I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to talk a bit and meditate a bit uh, and see how things go. Uh, is that all right? Yeah? Unstructured, uh, unor unorganized religion. Uh, <laughs> so uh, usually that tends to work out reasonably well, especially when people are you know, as good as most Buddhists are, so that's usually very helpful. So um, I'm going to just uh, read a little bit uh, from the sutta straight away here, uh, yeah, just to kind of get us started, uh, and then we start discussing how to go about meditation practice after that. Uh. So uh, all right. Uh. Okay, so the, um, uh, one of the suttas that I always like to use as the foundation for meditation, and it's kind of pretty obvious why I would use these suttas, is the Anapanasati Sutta, Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing, found in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha number 118. And uh, this is, uh, to my mind, probably yeah, the most um, uh, clear and obvious uh, instruction on meditation found in all the suttas. Uh, we know that uh, mindfulness of breathing was important for a number of reasons. The Buddha says himself uh, that he did mindfulness of breathing. Uh, this is found in the Sangyutta Nikaya, in the uh, Anapanasati Sangyutta, the connected discourses on mindfulness of breathing. There's a fair number, 20, 25 suttas there 
on mindfulness of breathing. One of them, number eight, is about the Buddha himself. And he says that he practiced this particular teaching. And he says, if you want to become enlightened, this is a teaching you should practice. Sir. Anyone here who does not want to be, become enlightened? Everyone is kind of, we don't, we don't know what it is. We think we want to become enlightened, but it's probably very different from what you think, right? Are you really sure you want to be enlightened? I, you know, when you hear about enlightenment or awakening, theoretically, it sounds a bit scary in some ways, right? Okay, on the one hand, it's the highest happiness. On the other hand, you have to give up your sense of self. Are you sure you want to give up your sense of self? Are you sure you want to kind of give up all of these things in the world? Um, it's, enlightenment is a little bit of mystery, yeah, but it's also very attractive on the kind of on the theoretical level. And if you want to reach that awakening experience, uh, somebody in the suttas. Uh, Mindfulness of breathing is the path to Sambodhi. Yeah. And to me, this is already very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that you know from the various meditation traditions in the world is that very often they are very complicated and flowery and have a lot of imagination uh, going in them. There's all kinds of flights of fancy. You're thinking about all kinds of things, visualizing things. Uh, but the Buddhist meditation practice is very, very down to earth. The main meditation practice is just mindfulness of breathing. It's the breath. It's the most kind of down to earth, the very, this very humble thing that we carry with us all at all times that we are so incredibly familiar with. We're so familiar with it that we're not familiar with it because it's there all the time. We forget about it. We take it for granted. And so this is, to me, already, is one of those beautiful things about Buddhism. Really, it is down to earth. It is about simple things. It is not about things that are very kind of wild and fancy and weird. And to me, this is uh, such an important point because it grounds us. It means that these are techniques that are universal, uh, can be used for anyone in any society and a culture. They're not culturally specific. Uh, and, uh, so, and this is kind of what makes it so powerful. Uh. And so Buddhism can really be summarized, to my mind, in two things. Uh, yeah? On the one hand, you have the mindfulness of breathing. Uh, on the other hand, you have the thing that leads us and enables us to do mindfulness of breathing, which is morality or kindness, if you like. Yeah. Kindness and mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And you don't need really much more than that on the Buddhist path. Yeah. If you fulfill those two things, uh, kind, kindness and mindfulness of breathing, yeah, basically awakening is uh, possible from that particular point of view. Yeah. So uh, this is what the Buddha says in that particular sutta. Yeah? So it's a very simple technique, really down to earth, super duper simple, and yet also extremely powerful at the same time. And so that's kind of very, already very fascinating. Yeah? And this is how the Anapanasati Sutta kind of starts out. Yeah? It starts out by telling us the promise of mindfulness of breathing and what it, where it actually gets us. So I'll just read just a, couple, a few sentences for you, just to kind of get us going with this. And so the Buddha says, he says, mendicants, actually he doesn't say mendicants, he says bhikkhu, bhikkhus, bhikkave, bhikkave, he says, mendicants is, uh, you know whose translation that is, mendicants? This is a monk called uh, Bhante Sujato, I don't know if you heard about him, yeah? And he, if you see the word mendicant, you know, Bhante Sujato, Bhante Sujato, yeah, no one else in the whole known universe uses that word to translate bhikkhu, huh? so it's kind of his, uh, his kind of characteristic. It's a very good word because it means almost exactly the same as bhikkhu. It means someone who is dependent on arms. It's a bit old-fashioned. Yeah, you don't, like I'm sure if you walk around in this local area, you don't hear many people using the word mendicant very often. Huh? Probably never. Huh? Uh, but it is very precise in terms of meaning. And that's kind of the nice thing about it. Huh? Anyway, mendicants. Huh? When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, huh? it is very fruitful and beneficial. Huh? The Buddha doesn't usually mince his words, so when he says very fruitful and beneficial, it usually means exactly that. It means really super duper beneficial and fruitful. The Buddha is a bit understated, a bit like the British. Yeah, now we're in the land of the British. The Buddha is a little bit like that. And he will say, oh, this is happiness. And when he says this happiness, it means it's the highest possible happiness, right? It doesn't mean kind of a little bit of happiness. It means the highest happiness. We have the famous... Uh, standard formula for the third jhana. And it says that in there that the third jhana, you attain it. And it says this is the state of which the Aryas declare you are happy. Yeah. 
Yeah? And it's the highest happiness you can possibly achieve. Yeah? So that's kind of that's how the Buddha usually works. So it's a good, useful thing to remember when you read the suttas that it tends to be understated. The Buddha does kind of blow things up. And the Buddha is more, much more British than he is American, if you know what I mean. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> if, when the Buddha, if you ask the Buddha how you are, he doesn't say great, he doesn't say fantastic. He says, okay, yeah, good, you know, all right, uh, yeah, or whatever. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> how are you? Yeah, yeah, Dukkha is kind of fading away. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's one of those interesting questions. What would the Buddha say if you asked him, How are you? That's one of those things that I have pondered sometimes. Uh, and um, that's a discussion for another time. Eh? <laughs> so it's very fruitful and beneficial. Eh? Oh, welcome. Please come in. Please come in. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Uh, he says, mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Four kinds of mindfulness meditation are the four satipatthanas. Yeah, and this is a very important thing right there. Yeah, the fact that if you do mindfulness of breathing, you fulfill everything, satipatthana, the whole thing from the very beginning. Kaya Nupassana, Vedana Nupassana, Chitta Nupassana, Dhamma Nupassana. Contemplation of body, contemplation of feelings, contemplation of mind, contemplation of Dhamma. That's a difficult one to translate. Phenomena, principles, something like that. And this is a very important point, because when you read the Satipatthana Sutta, yeah, the Sutta on the mindfulness meditation, are you familiar with that Sutta? Usually people are familiar with that Sutta, yeah? Um, and uh, very interesting sutta in many ways. Uh, but the weird thing about that sutta uh, is that when you read it, you see the mindfulness of breathing is only found in kaya nupassana, right? Uh, kaya nupassana, mindfulness of breathing. You don't find it under vedana nupassana or the other places. Uh, so if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, you could be forgiven uh, for concluding that mindfulness of breathing only is at the beginning. Yeah? And then you go on to feelings, you go on to mind and all of these kind of things. Uh, but that would be a mistake, yeah? because actually it fulfills the whole of Satipatthana. Yeah? And if you look at uh, some historical research into these suttas, uh, you actually do find out that uh, Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, does not really belong in the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah? It, doesn't, it shouldn't really be there. Yeah? And so, because when you put it in there, you put it under Kaya Nupassana, contemplation of the body, it gives precisely this distorted feeling that it's only a preliminary exercise that then goes on to Veda Nupassana and the other Satipatthanas. So it should probably be taken out. And the Kaya Nupassana probably is actually much simpler than what you find in the Satipatthana Sutta today. So if you want to have one technique, that finishes and completes and fulfills all the Satipatthanas without making it complicated, uh, without going into this idea of feelings and the body and uh, contemplating your mind states. Uh, mindfulness of breathing is all you require. Uh, and that's kind of a great relief in my opinion because it simplifies things. It makes it very clear what is going on. Uh, and then the Satipatthana Sutta becomes a supplementary thing. Uh, 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 in a, it becomes a particular way of understanding the process of mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. So that is how I prefer to read this. And it, in many ways it makes good sense, because if you go to the Satipatthana Sutta, the Vedana Nupassana contemplation of feeling, contemplation of mind, uh, it says, it just gives you a list. Yeah? You, you know this feeling, you know the Niramisa Sukha, the Samisa Sukha, you know the uh, uh, Dukkha, the Sukha, the uh, Dukkha Masukha, you, you know. The, okay, I should explain in English. Niramisa is the spiritual, uh, yeah, spiritual happiness, spiritual suffering. Samisa is more like the worldly happiness, worldly suffering. Uh, yeah? And so you know all of these feelings, but it doesn't give any context uh, for how you're supposed to know them. Uh, and that opens up enormous amounts of interpretation. Yeah? And uh, so the Gwenka tradition has their interpretation of this. Uh, but what is the Buddha's interpretation? Well, that seems to mean be that you follow the breath and through mindfulness of breathing, yeah, you experience all of these things. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's kind of really yeah, neat, nice, easy, simple, straightforward, yeah, uncomplicated. Yeah. Just follow the breath yeah, and you're in business. Yeah. 
So uh, you're in good business. This is kind of the one business line that's really worth, worth doing in this world, one line of business. So uh, that is uh, uh, just as already very interesting. Yeah. There's lots to be said about the Satipatthana Sutta. There's some very interesting studies done on that sutta, yeah, which kind of uh, are very, to my mind, very, very fascinating. Yeah. And uh, we can talk about that more later on if you're interested. Yeah. But uh, now I want to focus on Anapanasati and the basis of, of the meditation practice. I don't want to get too carried away by theoretical aspects. Otherwise, we're going to be here a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the four, then the Buddha says, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors. Uh, yeah, these are the sam, uh, sambhujangas. Uh, and uh, these are a very important set of dhammas, uh, part of the 37 bodhya pakya dhammas, uh, satatingsa bodhya pakya dhamma, uh, uh, which are the summary of all the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and uh, these are the factors that take you to awakening. That's why they're called awakening factors, because they take you to awakening. How do you fulfill them? Well, mindfulness of breathing, right? Mindfulness of breathing fulfills the four mind mindfulness meditations for Satipatthana, which then fulfill the seven Sambhujangas. So mindfulness of breathing does all of these things. And then the Buddha says, the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom. Yeah, vidja, vimutti, vimutti, vidja, vidja, vimutti. Yeah. Uh, so these are the endpoints of the Buddhist path, the purpose of the Buddhist practice, freedom. Uh, you want to be free or do you want to be in jail? Uh, better to be free, right? Uh, the thing is that we don't know that we are in jail. This is kind of the weird thing. We think that the jails of the world, yeah, the kind of the famous jails of the world, I don't know what they are, Alcatraz or something like that. I was in California recently, and they said, oh, the Alcatraz is down there. There's this island in the Bay Bay area. And is that Alcatraz? I think that's Alcatraz. And uh, so, um, <laughs> and, uh, but those kind of jails are, you know, they are nothing compared to the jail of the mind. The jail of the mind is the real problem. Uh, and that's why we want to escape from here. Uh, so, uh, Mindfulness of breathing takes you all the way to the end of the path, as long as it is supported by certain factors. I'm going to come back to those supporting factors later on, because they are very important to make this meditation work. Yeah. And then the Buddha says, and how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial? It is when a mendicant gone to a wilderness or to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut, sits down cross-legged, sets their body straight and establishes mindfulness in front of them. Just mindful they breathe in, mindful they breathe out. So that is the uh, kind of root instructions for Anapanasati. This is the foundation for Anapanasati. This is maybe the most important part of the whole Anapanasati Sutta. I shouldn't say that because I always regret saying these kind of things uh, when actually everything is important. Uh, but this is important because it is foundational and something that we all need to contemplate properly to make mindfulness of breathing work. Yeah. Yeah. And so you will hear here, that first of all, it says, gone to the wilderness or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut. It doesn't say the Thames Buddhist Vihara. <laughs> But this is quite close, right? It's not bad, because we are kind of going out of our ordinary home. We're coming to a place that is special for meditation practice. So I think Thames Buddhist Vihara is pretty good. It is not exactly the root of a tree. Well, actually, yeah, the root of a tree right here. The Buddha is sitting under his, he's doing that. But it's kind of a halfway house. And sometimes we have to deal with that. But what is interesting about this, and what is important about this, is that all of this points to the importance of seclusion on the Buddhist path. Yeah? Gone to the wilderness, uh, gone to the root of a tree or a foot of a tree. Uh, I don't know if you have seen those Indian trees. Uh, if, you, if you've grown up in the UK or, the, or kind of the northern hemisphere, uh, you've never seen these magnificent trees in India. Uh, right? Uh, these trees, the Bodhi tree, when the roots come down, uh, it's like a house. You can go inside and you can kind of sit like, like in a house almost. Uh, 
and they are really magnificent. Uh, and uh, so you have to kind of uh, take, Google it later on and get some pictures of, uh, of, uh, of the fig trees of India. And they're, they're really extraordinary trees. Uh, and they were perfect for meditation. It, you can find shelter under those trees, right? Foliage is very thick. The roots are very large. You can find room, room inside. Uh, and so uh, this is why this was so powerful. So you foot of a tree, the wilderness, which could be a cave, that sort of thing, or an empty hut, right? Uh, sunyagara is the Pali word for this. Uh, so seclusion is fundamental in Buddhism. Uh, and this is why we come here together, yeah, to get a little bit away from things, uh, and then we'll do some meditation together. And the reason why seclusion matters uh, is that when you are in the city life, uh, yeah, you are always surrounded by so many things. Uh, there's so many things going on, it's so busy. Uh, not only is it busy, but city life reminds you of the sensory world. Uh, sensory impact is often really powerful in city life. Uh, you cities is where you go to have your entertainment, cities is where you go to cafes, cities is where you uh, meet people to have a relationship, cities is where you go to nice restaurants. Uh, yeah, all the sens the sensual indulgence happens in cities. Uh, and uh, so the idea here is to withdraw a little bit from that, to allow that to die down a little bit, yeah? get, that, get out of uh, that kind of uh, overload of the mind uh, of sensory input. Uh, and also all the attraction and all the defilements and all the agitation and restlessness that arises due to those defilements. Uh, so you withdraw a little bit. And then once you withdraw physically from these things, uh, the mind also comes a little bit more into that right space uh, where those things are separated also from the mind. Uh, so in the suttas they talk about kaya viveka and chitta viveka. The seclusion of the body, seclusion of the mind. And one comes before the other. Uh, so seclusion is surprisingly important in Buddhism. And I would recommend you, if you are really serious about Buddhist practice and meditation, sometimes Go and have some real seclusion. Yeah, go and stay in a monastery for a while. Uh, go and go to a really nice retreat center. Yeah, far away, and, and see what happens to you. Uh, become a kind of a little monastic. Yeah, come be an anagarika in a monastery for a while, uh, um, and uh, then gradually, you know, you start to understand the power of seclusion. Uh, and then before you know it, you're wearing brown robes uh, as a consequence. Uh, yeah, because this is what happens. Uh, when you do this. So um, uh, this is the starting point. Yeah? And what this shows us, again, is that Anapanasati is a very profound meditation uh, te technique. Yeah? And it is very profound. That is why it has to be done in seclusion. It is not just some kind of superficial thing. Yeah? Um, uh, it's not superficial. Huh? Uh, and uh, so what it means, uh, unfortunately, is that for many people, it can be quite difficult to do mindfulness of breathing in ordinary life, yeah? Because it's not really meant for ordinary life. It's meant for seclusion and these kind of things. Uh, it doesn't mean you can never do it, uh, but it means that it is going to be often not easy to do. Uh, and many of you probably already have figured that out. It is not easy to do mindfulness of breathing in ordinary life. Yeah? It is just too refined, too subtle. And your mind is all over the place. Your mind wants to think about this, think about that. Your mind wants to fall asleep. You had a long day, and you have kids, and you have work, and you, some of you are really super busy. And when it comes to meditation, it's kind of, well, okay, maybe I can just relax a little bit. And that's okay. If you can, that's all you can do. But the real deal happens when you are secluded and you move a little bit out of that ordinary environment of yours. So this is the starting, yeah, seclusion. It is profound. It is a deep kind of meditation. You sit down, uh, yeah. Meditation, mindfulness, it happens when you sit down. Uh, it is because it is leads to very profound peace. Uh, if you have success with my mindfulness of breathing while you're walking, uh, you won't really know where you're walking anymore. Uh, that can be dangerous, right? Uh, if there's a cliff over there and you don't know that the cliff is coming, uh, okay, you have, may have a problem. Uh, if there's a tree standing in the way, or a car in the street, and you just walk into the street, uh, it doesn't help, you know, if, the, if you tell the police, oh, I was meditating, so they're not going to be too impressed with you, yeah, you walk in and you, you cause an accident or something, yeah? so please don't do that. Uh, so, uh, it happens in a sitting posture because it is very refined. Uh, 
It says specifically in the Sutta that you have to be cross-legged, palankang abhujitva. Palankang is a kind of the cross-legged posture. Um, I don't think you have to be cross-legged. Uh, cross-legged posture is very comfortable once you get used to it, and it's very kind of nice and steady and whatever. Uh, I think the reason why it is mentioned here is because this is how they were sitting at the time of the Buddha. People often sat on the floor, they were used to these kind of things. For many modern people, it is very hard to sit cross-legged. And you all end up torturing yourself, and that is not the point of meditation practice. So don't torture yourself. The main point of the posture is really to get the body out of the way here. The body is not what this is about. You kind of overcome the body, don't torture it, nor do you indulge it. And when you neither indulge it nor torture it, it kind of fades away because it becomes insignificant. Kind of one of those interesting things about the middle way. The middle way is really the middle way is just the way where the body disappears. That's really what it is. And uh, so, on the one hand, don't torture the body. On the one hand, don't indulge the body. Body is gone. If you torture the body, the body is important because the mind wants to solve the pain. If you indulge the body, the body is important because the mind wants to indulge in the pleasure or whatever it is. So either way, it is bad. So posture, right posture, is a posture where you are at ease, where you are comfortable. If you feel pain arising while you are sitting, please feel super free to change your posture. Yeah? A little bit of pain is fine because a little bit of pain is inevitable. But as soon as it becomes a little bit, you become a bit obsessed with the pain, you can't let go of it anymore, change your posture. Move your legs, get up from the floor, sit on a chair, lean against the wall, whatever it takes, yeah, to be, be at ease and be comfortable again. These are some of the basic ideas of meditation. Uh, and uh, then you set your body straight. So set your body straight because that cle- clears mindfulness a little bit, but again, do it at the right time. You can start off leaning back and then get the straight posture after a while. Uh, even the great meditators of the world, they often start by leaning back against the wall, for example, to really relax, yeah? And then the kind of things straighten up when the time is right. Uh, Ajahn Brahm tells me that he, he usually starts by leaning back against the wall in his meditation. Uh, yeah? Especially if he's tired uh, after a long day or whatever. And Ajahn Brahm is one of those super meditators. Uh, uh, and then comes the next one, uh, the last one here. You establish mindfulness in front of you. Satting parimukkang upatapetva. Having established mindfulness in front. Parimukkang is a tricky word, it translated in many different ways, but I think in front kind of gives a nice idea of what it means. It means in this space and time, yeah? In other words, right here, if you like. And uh, this is a very important part of the instruction for mindfulness of breathing. This happens first, having established mindfulness in front, only then do we do the mindfulness of breathing, yeah? We're having a discussion yesterday, we gave a talk yesterday in London at the London Buddhist, uh, London Buddhist Society. Uh, and uh, we had this discussion about the right translation of Satipatthana. Is it foundation of mindfulness or is it application of mindfulness or establishing a mindfulness or focus on mindfulness or mindfulness meditation or, or what is it? Uh, and uh, the, actually some of those translations are not so good because they, you, you start to interpret uh, Satipatthana in the wrong way simply by having the wrong translation. Uh, so what we see here is that um, actually mindfulness comes first, uh, then comes mindful, then comes the awareness of the breath. Uh, so first of all, you establish clarity of mind, the mindfulness, then you watch the breath. Uh, and this is a very important thing here, yeah, because many of you who have gone to meditation centers, uh, you will have been told, sit down, watch your breath. Uh, and straight away sit down, you start watching your breath. No, the Buddha doesn't say that. Uh, yeah, this is kind of this, this is misunderstanding. The Buddha says, first establish mindfulness. So for, what you should do is you should sit back, you should lean back, you should just relax, you should allow things to be, and you should use your mind to clear out the thoughts, clear out the tiredness, clear out whatever is blocking mindfulness from arising. And then when you clear that out, usually just by relaxing, just by waiting, by being patient, maybe guiding your mind a little bit, nudging the mind in certain directions, and then you will feel a degree of clarity, and then mindfulness or breathing almost comes by itself when the mind clears in this way. 
This is really the right way here. And the reason why this is important is because many people find that mindfulness of breathing is uncomfortable. Yeah, I have to force my mind on the breath. I have to use willpower to do this. And it becomes not really enjoyable. It becomes a little bit tense. It becomes a little bit not nice, basically. And not nice is not good. You want things to be nice in meditation. <laughs> yeah, isn't that... Aren't you all Buddhists because... Buddhism is supposed to bring more quality of life, not less quality of life. Many people use the Buddhist teachings and they actually get less quality of life. And that's kind of madness. Yeah. The whole purpose of a spiritual path is to improve our lives, not to kind of drag it down and make it worse. And so often you meet people who say things like, oh, I will never ever go on a meditation retreat again because it was the worst experience in my entire life. I've never felt so much pain. I never had so, so much stress and felt so, you know, uh, kind of tense as I did on this meditation retreat. Uh, and if you tell them that, well, not all meditation retreats are the same, they say, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to take any chances. Yeah, this was so bad. I'm never ever going to go again, uh, ever in this life, future lives, uh, anytime. Uh, they have been traumatized by meditation. Uh, that's bad news, uh, right? Uh, enough trauma already in this world. Uh, don't need trauma in meditation experience. Uh, so please avoid the traumas of meditation and try to enjoy the meditation. This is kind of the point of this. And if you go to the meditation object too quickly, you will actually not be able to enjoy what is going on. And this is the issue here. So wait, allow things to develop naturally, come to the breath when the breath is ready. Yeah, the breath, sort of one of the ideas that Ajahn Brahm often says, which I have kind of taken up, is the idea of waiting for the breath to come to you, rather than you going to the breath. And the idea behind that is just that the idea of uh, we allow it to arise naturally. We don't use willpower in relation to the breath, uh, but we allow things to develop in the right way. Uh, so, um, that is a little bit of background from the actual Anapanasati Sutta. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about uh, how to make this work in a practical way, because uh, it is not obvious how this is supposed to be done. Yeah? How can we guide our mind, how can we nudge our mind in such a way that the mind actually leans towards meditation and leans towards peace and all of these kind of things. And uh, one of the ways of understanding what it means not to do anything in meditation is actually very hard not to do anything here. Yeah? because we are doers by nature. When you are told, now we're going to meditate, the word meditation straight away sets off this chain reaction. Okay, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to watch the breath, I've got to avoid the hindrances. And so you end up doing things rather than just being. And so uh, to avoid the doing, actually very tricky. And one of the best ways to avoid all this doing is to set up certain perceptions in your mind, anti-doing perceptions. I think that's a new word, it hasn't been coined before, so I hereby coined this word. Uh, so next time the OED comes out, uh, we'll see if it is in there. Uh, so Oxford English Dictionary, right? Oxford English Dictionary is very interesting. Lots of Buddhist words uh, in the Oxford English Dictionary, by the way. Uh, if you check it out, uh, Samadhi, Jhana, Nirvana, Karma, Buddha, Dhamma, lots more. Sangha. Sangha, Sangha right, okay, Sangha. Bhikkhu, Bhikkhuni, maybe. We have some work, some work to, to do there. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, lots are, it's, things are already leaning in that way. Yeah? So things are kind of, this spiritual vocabulary is becoming more important in our society as uh, spiritual practice is becoming uh, more important. Uh, so um, we need certain perceptions, anti-doing perceptions. Uh, and uh, one of those perceptions uh, uh, that I sometimes use for myself uh, is the idea of sitting back in an armchair. Yeah, so now imagine that you have been to work. Yeah? Uh, I haven't worked much in my life, but I can imagine that it's really stressful <laughs> and problematic. I did actually work a little bit for a while, so I have some idea what it means. But uh, if you do go to work, yeah, you have had a long day at work, you're working really hard, you're reading this, writing reports, all kind of things, and often you are tired at the end of the day. Is that true? You're tired? Yeah? Okay, so you agree, so you, you know what it means. Good. 
So, and you're tired, and very often you're so exhausted when you come back home, you don't really want to, you, are, you just want to sit down somewhere, right? Okay, go to your favorite armchair, lean back, yeah, and just sit. Oh, jeepers, okay, wow, oh, so nice to kind of just sit down and close my eyes. And so the question is, what do you do at that point when you sit down in your armchair? And the answer is, you don't do anything, right? That's kind of the whole point of sitting down and wrestling your other. You don't say, okay, now, watch the breath. Yeah, okay, <sighs> watch, okay, do this, do that. Don't think this, do think that thought. No, all of that is out of the window because you just want to relax. And what relaxation means at that point, it means allowing the mind to flow. You have already been forcing your mind to do all kinds of things, reading, writing reports, all kinds of things, working hard. You've been forcing the whole day. Now you want to do the anti-forcing, the anti-doing. That's the whole point of relaxing in the armchair. So you allow things to flow. Yeah, this is the point of relaxing in this way. And this is really, in very large part, what meditation is about. This gives you an idea of what not doing actually means. Sitting back allowing the world to flow in exactly that way. So the armchair simile is a very useful for understanding the idea of non-doing it, because it is surprising how hard it is. I, I have a very, quite a good uh, monastic friend uh, who started out his monastic life in Sri Lanka. He's, uh, he's from the Czech Republic originally, uh, very nice guy, very good meditator, uh, yeah, one of these people who gets really good samadhi. Uh, and he told me, even though his samadhi was really good, uh, he said that uh, he said, it's amazing yeah, how much doing I still do, even though my samadhi is still so good. Huh? Yeah? And then he says, well, I, I just listened more to Ajahn Brah. Okay, then finally the penny dropped. Uh, penny? Uh, yeah, penny. Yeah, penny, right. Okay, penny, yeah. Pounds or pennies, is that right? Uh, yeah. Okay, I haven't, I haven't lived in... Uh, pen Not cents, no. okay. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, penny drops, yeah? And when the penny drops, okay, let go even more. And then you become really peaceful. So this idea of doing too much, uh, it's actually something that you bring with you usually a long, long way on the path. So it's really useful to kind of get, understand what it means not to do things uh, and allow the process uh, to kind of take its own course, uh, yeah, in this way. Uh. So one way, that's one way of thinking about it, the idea, the simile of the armchair. Uh. But that's not really enough. Uh. Because if you just sit in that armchair, you may end up thinking all the time, right? And you think and think and think, and suddenly the hour is gone. Okay, and then go and have lunch or whatever. But uh, that wasn't really all that productive. So there's more to it than just letting go in this way. And the other thing that there is to meditation is to enjoy the experience of meditation. So another simile that can be nice to use is the simile of watching a sunset. Yeah, when you are watching a sunset, you're not really doing anything, right? You're not saying, watch, 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 yeah, okay, keep your eye on the sun, yeah, watch. You're not doing that, you're just sitting back and enjoying it. But the point of the sunset is that it is something attractive. So your mind is naturally drawn towards that object. Yeah, you don't have to force yourself to see it because actually you, your mind naturally wants to go there. Huh? And this is the other aspect then of meditation practice. On the one hand, you let go, huh? you allow things to be, huh? but you're also attracted to the object. Huh? You see the breath in a beautiful way. Huh? You see the breath as peaceful. Huh? You see the breath as giving potentially joy. Huh? And then you use your uh, mind to nudge the mind in the right direction so as to specifically give rise to joy together with that breath. And I will come back later on to how to do that. Uh, yeah, so simile of the armchair, simile of the sunset, uh, these are great ways of giving rise to uh, that right kind of mindfulness. Uh, yeah, often people they get mindful but they use too much willpower. You want to come in? Please come in. Please enter in. Uh, yeah. Have you got some flowers for the shrine? Yeah, please, yeah. Oi. Okay. Please, please come up there. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent.
So now those flowers, they are going to give rise to joy later on when we do the mindfulness of breathing, right? So it's kind of it's a beautiful gesture to bring flowers to the shrine. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of part of that uh, beauty perception. Yeah. So this is uh, one way of doing this. Uh, another way of doing, kind of bringing the mind into the present moment, uh, which can be very powerful if you're used to it, uh, and that is to do the death contemplation. Uh. And death contemplation, the way to do that, uh, very simply, uh, is that you, uh, first of all, you start off, you don't go straight away to the death contemplation, you start off by allowing things to calm down a little bit, first of all, uh, yeah? You get a degree of clarity. When you have a degree of clarity, uh, then you can use the death contemplation to bring even more clarity. Uh. And of course, the purpose of the death contemplation uh, is the idea that we never know when we're going to die. Uh. And because we never know when we're going to die, we have to be ready now. Now is the only time you can be ready. You can't wait till later on because then you might already be dead. Now is the time to be ready. Yeah? And if you are ready to die now, that has a very powerful impact on the mind. What if you're going to be dead before this next meditation is finished? What does that mean? Well, what it means is that the things of the world become largely irrelevant to you. Yeah, if you're never going to have any, see anyone again, if you're never going to have any interaction with the world outside, you're never going to do anything or buy anything or eat anything, it's like the whole world becomes kind of irrelevant. And the idea of the world becoming irrelevant makes your mind very peaceful. It makes your mind peaceful because almost all our thinking is about the world in one way or another. About the problems we have, about our job, about our family members, about things that we need to do about enjoyments that we're going to have, all of these kind of things. That is what our thoughts revolve around. It's very rare that people fantasize about meditation. Yeah. Isn't that quite rare? It should be like that. It should be like when you are at work, you should be fantasizing about meditation. Oh, I wish I could meditate. When can I meditate? Two hours left to go? Okay, I can hold out for those two hours. That is kind of the ideal way, right? And that, if, if that is how you are, it means that you're really heading towards uh, meditation and the spiritual path in a powerful way, fantasizing about meditation practice. Uh. But usually it's the other way around. Uh. Usually it is you meditate and you're fantasizing or thinking about the world. Uh. And death contemplation is a very, very powerful way when it starts to hold, when it starts to work, uh, to overcome worldly thinking, because the world is largely irrelevant uh, in the face of death. Uh. Yeah, so try to make it real. The trick about death contemplation is to make it real eh? and to really know that you never know when you are going to die. And because of that, now is the time to bring it home. Now is the time to feel that it can happen at any time. Eh? And the more close you bring it to the present moment, eh, the more power it has eh, to overcome these defilements and these problems of the mind. Eh? So uh, that is some very simple instructions for you uh, about meditation. Uh, and uh, while you do this, if you are going to use some of these ideas in your meditation practice or any ideas that you use, uh, don't just use it very gently. Yeah? Nudge your mind a little bit. Uh, just remind yourself a little bit of, okay, let me just relax like I'm in an armchair. Let me just watch the sunset of the beautiful peace that comes with this terrain. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to die. Some simple perceptions in your mind. Uh, uh, not think a lot about it, uh, but bring it up as a simple perception. Uh, and uh, the time to reflect on these things is usually outside of meditation. Maybe afterwards, when if you go walking around a little bit or you go for some walking meditation, then you can develop these ideas in your mind. You can reflect on them, cultivate them. Uh, and then that way you develop something uh, that you can bring back into your meditation and use in your meditation practice. Uh, so that is uh, some very basic ideas about how meditation works. Uh, there is a lot more to be said, but uh, I think I've been talking for close to an hour already, or not something like that. So uh, maybe we should do some uh, meditation together.